You know, putting on a social scientist at the very end of a research day, right before you want to drink wine and talk about crop insurance, I don't know, planning should have been better, but anyway, <laughs> I'm used to this. I've been working in crop insurance and organic agriculture and sustainable agriculture. I've been working on this topic, I couldn't believe it. On my, this is my 13th year exploring crop insurance and agriculture. And anybody would ask me that, that I would have done that in my life, I would have said they were absolutely nuts and I would have never thought I had gone down this road. But it has been an interesting road, nonetheless. And how do I go forward? Is there a um, clicker? There's a clicker right here, and it has a laser. OK, and which one is forward? Forward is on the left, and back is on the right. Here's the laser. So here's the laser. Here's the laser. It's not working. Oh, sorry. I think I got it backwards. Ah, yes. OK, Trivia Pursuits, quickly. <laughs> when was the first crop insurance policy written for an organic farm? There's some people who might have been involved in this grant. They're not in the room. Good. So they would have known uh, next year. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you thought about it, think about when the Organic Act was implemented, and literally one year after it was started to be implemented, four people showed up at the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation and made a pitch to have organic farming insured. And if people were in the organic movement, they might know who some of those people are, but one interesting senator that was there was a guy named Chuck Schumer. Have you heard of him? Yeah. He actually um, was there defending organic, wanting to have, and so 20 policies. Today, 67 different crops, 8,000 policies. This is a really hard number to come up with because a, a farmer could take out multiple policies. It's very hard to get the statistics. I estimate 30% of certified farmers are insured to some degree. Uh, and that's compared to 16% of all farmers in the nation. So organic farmers, I would argue, probably are using it more than non-organic farmers. And you notice I say non-organic because I don't like the word conventional. Uh, 1.2 million acres sold, uh, 940 million of liability. This is basically the value of what is covered by insurance. Eight, $9.4 million in organic premiums, what you pay in, you know premiums, and indemnities is the payout. And the loss ratio is an important concept we'll get back to earlier, but it basically overall, uh, over average, means that for every dollar paid in on average, $1.61 was paid out. So organic farmers have been using and benefiting at least in 2017. Okay, organic agriculture is usually has diverse crops, protects soils, high prices, all the things we've been talking about, and even has great profit potential. I can document an ERS study that recently in 2015 did a really good analysis by corn, soybeans, and wheat, unfortunately, but showed there's great profit potential. You probably know that better than anyone. So why are there so many organic farmers? Is it because organic farming is more risky? Now, I'm going to talk about financial and production. I'm going to talk about what economists call price and quantity. When you might multiply price times quantity, you get revenue. So I'm fundamentally talking about economic risk. I'm not talking about different methods to alleviate risk other than the things that like a price or things like hail or whatever that could, or just yield in general that could affect your ability to make money. Um, and this research uses data from organic and unorganic farms between these three years um, to explore this question. Key terms. I already explained this a little bit. Crop insurance loss ratio. It's the indemnity divided by the pay-in. So you could, the example there I think is pretty clear. What you don't know, and um, crop insurance could be thought of as a giant nonprofit situation in the United States, because it's both public and private. You buy insurance from a private agent, but essentially the control of how policies and premiums are set is done by the federal government. They're basically hired as a service, and they share in the loss and the gains of that profit. And they actually make a very big argument about this, but they make a pretty, pretty good profit on being an insurance agent, at least a stable profit level. And people argue about whether it's too high or too low. 
Um, this is the key question for this research. Does loss, is loss ratio a measurement of risk? And I will argue that it is. And the reason it is, is because what an insurance actuary, the person who sends the premium for crop insurance policy does, is their job. If you were in a profit situation, you would try to set the premium so that the pool of people insured would essentially pay in more than they paid out. So you would get a profit. And with that profit, you invest that profit and you make money for your insurance company. That's mostly how private insurance works. So it's very important to be an act. That's why actuaries get paid a lot. It's because they have to take all this data and try to figure out how to set that premium and get that loss ratio to be really higher than one. Under federal policy, though, they don't want to be gouging you guys, so they don't want to charge you more to make profit. What they want to do is be a nonprofit. So they want to make that loss ratio on average, not of course individuals, but on average for the pool of people insured to be one. If they do that consistently over time, and they use very sophisticated statisticians and things that I don't quite fully understand, but they try to set this premium and they try to get it about one. And if over time, a individual farmer or a group of farmers is getting, is not, is, is at one, then essentially persons that get less than one, they are as such less risky and the ones greater than one are more risky because they're constantly getting money back. You follow the logic of it. That's the logic. There's a lot of arguments about this, but that's the principal logic that I work for this. The other thing I've been battled in for these 13 years, this is the 13th year, is whole farm revenue. And I don't know if anybody take out a whole farm revenue policy in this room. I'd be really surprised. Holy, I want to talk to you. <laughs> there are not many people that, it's only, we'll get into that, not many people that have done it. Um, and that's another problem in itself. But it actually existed much earlier in a form called adjusted gross revenue insurance, which was available in various states and counties around the United States, but never nationally. And the 2014 Farm Bill, through lots of work and effort, um, Senator Stabenow from Michigan, pressed hard and created the Whole Farm Revenue Program, which now, since 2015, is nationwide, can be bought in any county, in any, any state in the United States, and can cover any crop and livestock product up to a maximum amount of liability, and there's some jigging around how much livestock value and all that, but basically it covers anything. But, it's the whole farm revenue that's being protected. You understand? And it's, so it's not like any other kind of crop insurance. It's not in, you're not insuring your corn, you're not insuring your soybeans, you're insuring based on your historical revenue, an average of your historical revenue coming from your tax forms, which everybody will freak out about, because but that's where it comes from, the data. And they say, this is your average and you can get up to 85% coverage of that historic average. So in the year of insurance, if your income drops below 85%, you will be bumped up, so you're guaranteed at least 85% of your historic revenue. It's whole farm. You can grow what you want, how you want to grow it, what variations of crops you want. We're not concerned about those things, but we're concerned about more is protecting your revenue. As an economist, I think farmers might be more interested than that in just particular crops. We also did a survey of organic farmers, and I'm not going to do that. That's a paper, that's another part of our project. This is an OREI grant, started in 2014. One year of extension will be done in about August. We have three papers uh, going to be published, we hope, and one of them is going to be on the survey, one of them is going to be on the work I'm presenting today, and one's going to be done by my colleague Eric Velasco, a professor at Montana State University, an ag economist as well, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that if I have time. Um, I was motivated to do this from some studies that were done by RMA, the Risk Management Agency is the USDA agency involved in crop insurance, and they said this, uh, Insured producers with organic crops experienced a program-wide loss of 105. That's really the loss ratio. So a little bit slightly above neutral. They're a little bit more risky. While at the same time, those in the same places only experienced 67%. On the basis of, and I can, I don't really, the study is huge. 
It was commissioned. It wasn't done by RMA. Uh, d in, done by insurance actuarial people, but I found a lot of fallacies in the methodology they used, and it's what motivated me to, to look at this ca carefully. Oh my God, we're running out of time. Here we go. Here's the um, here's some of the results I, I just of the survey, greater than 100,000, and you can see that if you look at we divided into four categories, and you can see that um, in general those. Organic and commercial, I would call them, are using whole farm more than others. The loss ratio of all individual farm levels, I actually got this data and I want to thank Mark Lees. This is the real policy data from RMA, 6,000 policies in total that we're analyzing here. The method the hypothesis is that the mean loss ratio of organic users of whole farm will not be significantly different than the mean loss ratios of non-organic users versus that they will. Variables, dependent variables, organic or non-organic farms, and this loss ratio is this measure of risk. Here's uh, some other attributes of the policies in general. You can see that, uh, that organic people aren't using whole farm revenue, despite the fact that we thought being diverse farms whose value is incorporated in their historic revenue would have been really wanting to buy this. And here's my results. By year and by across the board and basically there's no significant difference and that's my test so i would argue this is generally contradicts the overall view that organic farmers are more risky which tends to i think to be the common knowledge what i think this shows because it's also whole farm shows that in fact they're no more riskier or at least we statistically don't know that they aren't and i think that's a big take home and it's something that, you know, I don't like these myths in organic our agriculture that, you know, these are riskier and therefore they aren't using, of course, they're not using the right technology. Of course, they have to be more risky. But not all things are created equal in terms of this loss ratio. And it has to do with what we call rating methodology. And one thing I came out finally, even contradicting myself, is perhaps over time as we collect data, we should set the premiums distinctly different for organic farms than for non-organic farms because they're fundamentally different systems of production. If they are fundamentally different systems of government, they're inherently going to have different risks. Therefore, when you set the premiums, you should set them differently. Right now, they treat, in a, in, from an insurance point of view, organic farms as if they are non-organic farms. And the conclusions, first study of its kind, Never had this data analyzed before. Do organic and organic production systems differ so much that they ought to be rated differently? Organic farms are not using whole farm revenue. Why? I have, that's the other paper, and we'll explain that, and I can go into that. This is a citation and questions. You still have a couple minutes. Oh, I have a couple minutes. She got me so scared with five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't show you the two I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> well, and. And, uh, okay, I got two minutes. <laughs> maybe I should just take questions because uh, maybe the questions will actually drive this better. Why people aren't, what's interesting in the details, and I couldn't do it in this 15 minute uh, presentation, is you can buy a whole farm, whether you buy it for one commodity, two commodities, three products, four products, five products, up to N products. When we actually analyze the data, first of all, not many organic farmers are using it, which is really bizarre. In California, over three years being available, only four policies were written in the whole state, the most, you know, where the most organic farmers in the country are, with specialty crops where they can't get any other alternative insurance. And this is whole farm, and it incentivizes, I didn't tell you this, but it also incentivizes diversity. The more diverse your farm, the lower the cost. It just makes logical sense, eggs in one basket kind of thing. And it actually, not only, not only if you have three or more crops do you get, your subsidization of the premium up to a significant amount, it actually takes the rating of your premium cost, which is different for every county, and it gives you up to 60% in additional. So it's the most inexpensive, fairly reasonable coverage uh, insurance, and yet no one is using it. And we have a whole bunch of reasons as to why, and we're actually, because we were timing is just perfect with the passage of the farm bill, we're actually going to go to RMA and we're going to actually talk to them and we're going to tell, and we have it in the farm bill to say, thou shalt fix this policy because Senator Stabenow helped us out again and said, 
make it work better. So we, we have all the data, we're ready to go, and we're going to make it better even for people. But I will let, now leave it open to anyone, particularly those who have used it and have any questions about it. Yeah? Well, yeah, you know, this is the question that just kind of generally, I, I, was, I was curious, how often is this kind of loss ratio approach done for looking at the riskiness of things? And, and, and the reason I ask is how important is kind of the uh, you know, sample bias fit into this? And you know, I don't know anything about insurance, but I just right. remember when the whole individual mandate with universal health care came in right. and the idea of like, well, we need to make sure that it isn't, if we don't, the, the smaller the pool, the more likely it's the it's riskiest, called, the high risk people are going to be in there. Yeah, yeah, it's a fancy ass word called adverse selection. And it actually is a, a problem. And, and, and it is, what is the pool that you're trying to determine the premium for? The problem is, there's a guy, this Mark Lee, sits in his basement, actually works off the side. I talked to him for a year, and he's giving me all this data. You know, it, it's very hard to set the premium for a diverse farm. Imagine that all across the country, in every county, you have to come up with a premium rate. And of course, there's going to be this adverse selection for, and you do have the full total pool of possible people. Is adverse selection affecting the result more than thing? It's more research to do and figure that out. Um, I would say that the difference, between, and yes, loss ratio, I pointed to one study that motivated it, and yes, loss ratio is used as a proxy for risk. And it was used to actually determine policy, which I could go into, uh, to change policy about county average level yields and how we do insurance with organic, which is a no, no other subject. but. But the point being is that this is the only one that's looked at a farm as a whole, as a, as a whole unit of economic, you know, developing, producing a revenue. And since it's set, set that way, and since they're doing their best to try to get this premium so it's one, you know, we just have to go with the idea that they are trying to do the best they can using the data they have, which is limited. They're trying to set it. So I'm just taking under the assumption that that's right. And of course, we. I can't do that. I didn't do that here. But if anybody wants me to do it for their state, I can do it for their state. I've been doing this for people. They want to know, what's, how, how's Whole Farm working in my state? I will do a personal analysis for you because I work with NCAT and Natura, and that's our job. <laughs> and so I can do that for you. We have a lot of publications. We're going to have a new website, and we're going to publish research. And uh, you can get into this as deep as you want to, but I would, I would drink some wine before you get too deep into it. <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. In general, farming is a risky business. Oh, it's risky business everywhere. <laughs> why, why would one think that uh, uh, organic might be riskier than uh, conventional? What I'm arguing is that it's no more risky. I mean, the, the, the beginning thought that one might be riskier than the other one, I don't know, I don't see the foundation of it. The, the foundation of it in the United States, I would argue, goes back to the idea that we have developed technologies for non-organic farms that are supposedly limit risk, that promote yield, that use pesticides, that use GMOs, that use these technologies. And if, if, a, if a group of people decide not to use these technologies, they must be logically putting themselves more at risk because they're not using the best science to do the best job to produce a crop. I don't believe that. <laughs> I believe that organic farmers are just as smart, know how to manipulate nature in a way that other people haven't figured out, and therefore are likely not to be as risky as others. And I have some data now that shows that we at least can't tell statistically. Yes? OK, so maybe that's not quite the right question, and especially as it relates to hope. I mean, maybe or I actually do keep thinking organic. I, I've got that bias myself, being an organic farmer, but I've also been a conventional farmer. Uh, but anyway, maybe that's not the right question as to why people aren't using the whole food. I think inherently certain crops are more risky than other crops. Absolutely. And, and so I divide up a farm into different, uh, you know, like I'm big enough to put it in a different LLCs, then they buy the whole farm for just the crops that are risky. Yeah, you're, actually, we found many people doing that. One thing I failed to mention, a uh, proviso of this policy is that you can, it's called mix and match. If you have a particular cop that is really a significant part of your revenue, you can ensure that independent if it's available in your county. One thing that people don't understand, we have 62 different kinds of policies for organic, but they are not. You know, there are about only three states that you can buy an organic cabbage policy in. 
So it, you can't buy, you can't buy fresh tomatoes in my state of Montana. You can't buy an organic policy farm. I can buy a whole farm. So, but in, in Montana, I can also buy a really good revenue wheat organic policy. And so if I have a lot of my income coming from wheat, and maybe I'm doing hemp, for instance, which doesn't have any insurance policy for, but it's going to become a significant part of my I do the farm with whole farm and put a separate policy, and I can do that under this policy. I can mix and match my policies. Some people might have their income distributed pretty evenly across their farm, and that, and if they have a, a revenue that historically reflects their current revenue, are likely to buy whole farm just by itself. You understand? Because they don't, they have, their eggs are distributed pretty evenly across and any one thing could go up or down. Remember, everything could go up and down. So you might not never collect on a, there's a lot of people that don't collect on one because what happens is something goes good and something goes bad and your overall revenue doesn't stay the same. But at the same time, it's still a pretty good insurance in terms of catastrophic and anything, what if two or three things that are important to you, either their price or their yield change is significant because of damage, boom, you've got a coverage. I'm, I always feel like I start to become a salesman for <laughs> property, but I really don't intend to be. <laughs> Took 13 years to do that, believe me. I've gone to every, I've gone to every organic and non-organic conference, and I go to the thing, and I go, and I sit at the door, and I try to drag people in, and I get five people. I mean, I've, I've been like, a, like a, an evangelist that cannot talk to anybody, so, so I've got, it's probably one of the biggest crowds I ever have had. <laughs> <laughs> talking about crop insurance. <laughs> and that's all because you're waiting for wine, and otherwise you wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, can we have one more quick yes. And then we, can we certainly had that experience on a very highly diversified organic farm in California where we produced you know, as many as 40 crops over right. all four seasons. And over many, many years, the gross revenue per, you know, total gross revenue was very predictable. Yes. It's very unproducible, right. not necessarily the profit margin, however. Oh, yeah. But I would also suspect that uh, wanting to buy a whole farm revenue policy would have possibly cost the entire <laughs> the entire profit margin of, of the farm. No, it's um, cheap. It's relatively inexpensive. I would argue that it probably isn't that expensive. What I would what I pursued it. what I would agree with you is that what we have found, and I didn't report this, is that if you're a highly diverse farm, you won't buy this. Partly because the paperwork is too cumbersome and you have to maintain really excellent records to be able to get a claim. Right. And if you have 40 different crops, forget it. Yeah. And your diversity yeah. is your insurance. Right. And also, if I were the insurer and I was paying out a dollar thirty for every dollar of uh, right. premiums, I was like, I wouldn't be in business anymore. But this is the federal government. We don't have to be. <laughs> oh, but that's right. They don't have to be. No, they have to. Be, they have to. They are, do a good job. Right now, they're actually collecting money and putting it in a bank for the, the years when, when it crashes. So by setting the national policy at this one loss ratio, that, that does force them very hard. They are very paranoid about, about missing that one. Because if they miss that one, then people are going to start to scream. Because they're going to say, you're charging us more than you should be charging us for this insurance. If, of course, it's the other side, then the politicians are saying, why the hell is crop insurance costing you so much over all these years? Aren't you setting your premiums correct? So they got, I give them a lot of credit, they got pressure from two sides saying, hit one, hit one, and they do their best to hit one. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. All right. Thank you. <laughs>